Hello, everybody. Ooh. Welcome, welcome. It's so great to see people here interested in learning about shorebirds and um, how we can all help them. And so I love seeing people here interested in that. I'm Betty Papillo. I'm the coordinator for the Shorebird Stewardship Program. So I'm extra thrilled to see all these people interested in birds. Um, so we're gonna, uh, what we're gonna do today is Aaron is gonna talk all about the birds that we have here on Kiowa and the challenges that they face and how we can help them. And then at the end, I'll just give you a little bit about what we do as shorebird stewards. So, and that's a big piece of what we're trying to do here on Kiowa is have stewards. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron. All right, hey everybody. Um, I'm just gonna go make sure it's streaming and everything's going right here real quick. Okay, well thanks for coming. Um, today we're just, like Betty said, we're just gonna talk about the Shorebird Stewardship Program. Uh, I wanna give you some more kind of biology type stuff um, on the shorebirds that we have here on the island. Um, so first I'm just gonna start off uh, Uh, talking a little bit about why we need to protect shorebirds. Um, you know, there was a study back in 2019 that looked at all bird species, and you may have heard about it. It made, you know, national headlines when this study came out that since 1970, we've lost like 2.9 billion birds. Um, and some of the groups of species that have been most impacted um, were forest birds, which have been down, they, they can set about down 22%, grassland birds, 53%, and shorebirds at 37%. Now, there's other studies out there as well um, that say some shorebirds are declining at a rate of 68%. Um, you know, there's some studies that look at individual species. So, for instance, ready turn stones, you know, have seen a, a very large decline since, uh, since the 70s. Uh, Semi-palmated sandpiper populations are also decreasing. Uh, red knots, um, they've seen a 70 to 80, but that, that number could even be higher than that now um, between the 80s to the early 2000s. Um, some good news is American oyster catchers uh, seem to be doing well, and one study reported that uh, that their numbers actually increased by 23%. So um, it's not all doom and gloom, but but a lot of it not not looking good for shorebirds. Uh, and this is a, a recent study that just came out, um, and this shows um, this the title is "Accelerating Declines of North American Shorebirds Signal the Need for Urgent Conservation Action." Um, so this next slide kind of shows how powerful this is. So this is 28 different species of shorebirds. So that line at zero, basically the, you're, at, you're on your, your left at your axis there is, is the total percent change in population estimate between 1980 and 2019. So anything above the line is showing a positive trend anything below that line is showing a negative trend. So there's only two species that are actually showing somewhat of an increase, although that's even small, uh, compared to all those other species um, that are showing very significant declines, including red knot, which is way over there to your left, um, that, that's showing, looking at almost a 95% uh, decline in um, between those, those years. Uh, so these, the, this study was looking at only fall migration numbers. Um, so some of the other studies look at different seasonalities. So um, just kind of goes to show you that, you know, it, it depends on what, what, what they're looking at. You know, you're, we're gonna get different decline, different numbers um, and different rates of change depending on how the study is conducted. But most of these studies all conclude that their numbers are, are going down. <clears throat> The, this is the same study. Uh, this is a little busier of a graph, but it shows very similar things. Um, and looking again at the red knot, which is about halfway down, uh, you can see the, the black line with the, 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 the black dot 
and then you've got the green line with the green dot. And those are very far apart from each other, which basically just means that um, the, the distance between those is just showing the, the greater acceleration of, of change and de or decline in their, in their population. And again, this is that same graph um, that is showing uh, populations of these shorebird species uh, in relation to the, U, uh, the IUCN um, designation. Um, so if you're looking at, they have a designation that if there's a 30% decrease in the population, then that species is, is uh, determined to be vulnerable. And if it's a dec if it's uh, decreasing at a negative fifty or a uh, fifty percent decrease, um, then those species are are endangered of uh, of becoming you know even worse. So it's not official designation like the endangered species list or anything. Uh, it's a completely different list, but it is showing how how rapidly declining some of these species are. Um, all right, so why, why, do, why do we these birds need our protection? Uh, first, habitat loss. Um, you know, this is, can come naturally. We have hurricanes here. We have sea level rise. Uh, both of those things can cause changes to our beach. Uh, the beaches are a very dynamic area already. Um, so shorebirds are used to um, having things be different from year to year, you know. So they have to be flexible in, in what they uh, what they, where they eat and, and where they can find food and where they roost and all that because the beach is always changing. Uh, there's also human-caused habitat loss by increased development. Um, there's, and then sea level rise and climate change uh, also is, is going to be changing, changing our beaches. Uh, disturbance, that's another, another big, big reason for, for why these birds need our help. Um, this, this can come just by, by beachgoers. Just people walking on the beach can cause disturbance to these birds. So, um, you know, part of this program uh, is directly aimed at talking to people on the beach and educating them why these birds um, need to be protected, why they shouldn't be disturbed um, because of, of the reason they're here. You know, they're, they're here to eat, they're here to rest, and if they're here and they're getting constantly flushed by people and dogs and other things, they're using up that energy uh, that, they, that they're needing to, to make it to, um, to the breeding grounds and nest and things like that. Uh, loss of food. Um, there's, uh, in particular for red knots and a lot of other species, um, they have um, relied on these, these predictable abundances of food uh, in particular with horseshoe crabs, um, which spawn at certain times and they lay lots and lots of eggs. Uh, and sometimes, a lot of these places are historical areas where shorebirds, they, these crabs come in, they congregate, they breed, and there's millions and millions and millions of, of horseshoe crab eggs. The birds then come into those areas to feed on these. Um, the eggs are full of fat. They can get a lot of fat really quickly um, to kind of get to continue their migration. Um, but there's been um, some, the horseshoe crab population is now decreasing due to uh, harvesting um, for either fishing, they use horseshoe crabs as bait for commercial fishing, uh, and also for, um, they collect the horseshoe crabs for, um, and they, they, they take their blood for uh, medical uh, research. Uh, now they, they release a lot of those back into the wild, um, and, but we don't know really kind of the, the long-term effects on, on, you know, taking horseshoe crab blood and, and if those, those crabs are, are surviving after that. Uh, and then in some parts of the world, shorebirds are actually hunted. So, um, you know, a lot of, you know, the, a lot of these birds are migrating globally, right? So, you know, we, we don't have shorebird hunting in, in, the, in the North America. But in other parts of the world um, where um, people actually use, need sometimes to hunt birds for, for food, um, they are hunted, um, especially in, in like smaller islands and things like that. 
So of these things, really the only thing that, that one of the things that we can do um, kind of here on the island is kind of to tackle the, the disturbance part, which is kind of why we have the Shorebird Stewardship Program. So that's kind of what we're going to focus mainly on today is trying to limit um, the, the, the disturbance aspect on, on these birds. So what can we do? Um, hold on real quick. I'm going to turn these lights on. A little better. Um, so what are some of the things that we can do? So we can protect key habitats, um, which we do here on Kiowa, uh, and I'll, I'll get into that here in a minute. We can educate the public, which we, we do as well. Um, there's a lot of different, between the town and Kika, the Conservancy, we put out a lot of different um, PSAs, if you will, different e-blasts and things, just kind of reminding people about the birds, why they're here, why they need to be protected. Uh, and then lastly, we have this, the Storebird Stewardship Program. That's kind of the, the boots on the ground type of work, you know, where we're actively going out, we're talking to people, we're educating them on shorebirds and why they need protection. Uh, so the protected areas, I'll start with just kind of going by that. So on Kiowa, we have two major areas on the island that we have designated as critical habitat. Um, and this is critical habitat for, for shorebirds. Uh, it's critical habitat for bottlenose dolphins. It's critical habitat for uh, loggerhead sea turtles. Um, now, the, the entire beach is listed as critical habitat for, for turtles as well. Um, but the ends of the islands, we've deemed to be super important for all these different species. Uh, therefore, we've done some extra um, regulations in those areas. For instance, at these critical habitat areas, the, the one on the, the left is the east end, which is just past the ocean course, and it goes all the way around to the end of the island towards the Stono Inlet. And then down at, on the west end of the island, just, just, just west of Beachwalker Park, um, about, I don't know, half a mile or, or less, um, it starts the critical habitat area. And, and those areas are, uh, we have basically blocked off as, as no dog zones on the island. Um, so we don't allow dogs there at any time of the year. In addition, uh, during the breeding season, uh, we have uh, nesting areas that we uh, close down as well. Um, so this area here is the east end, which is just past the Ocean Course Clubhouse. And you'll see this is historically the areas where we have American oyster catchers, we have willets, we have Wilson's plovers, um, and we have least terns that, that, that nest in these kind of these higher duny uh, parts of the beach. Um, it, this actually looks a little different than this picture uh, because there is a... I'll just come over here. So right here, there's an inlet that is formed now that's not on this map. Um, so there's water that flows through here that's kind of broken this area off. But at, at low tide, you can still cross it fairly easily and get, get across that area. Um, so what, um, so this area here gets signed every year um, with those yellow signs in the left-hand corner. Uh, and I actually, I did that on Monday and Tuesday. So uh, I, put, there's a hundred, I put up 122 signs ringing basically that first area. Um, and I ran out of signs. So I did not mark that little area kind of further. So I might try to get that later. Um, but that other area is much harder to get to people usually don't go out to there because there's actually, to get to that, you have to cross on a second inlet. Um, so I think that people probably get a little deterred for going that far out. So those birds that are, that are using that area are actually probably in pretty good shape. Um, but there's a lot more traffic here um, coming out towards the ocean course. Uh, so that'll be closed down um, behind those signs until the nesting season is over. That is usually August-ish. Uh, or until we get the first hurricane slash uh, tropical storm, and then I have to take them all down because they'll get washed away in the ocean. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, and this is probably a good point just to kind of throw up the, our, our pet ordinance um, for, for what dogs can and can't do on the beach and when. So uh, again, the, the ends of the islands in red, that's the critical habitat areas. Uh, we don't allow dogs there um, year round. <clears throat> There's a seasonal dog leash area that stretches pretty much the entire middle part of the island. Uh, and that area is, um, dogs can be off leash, but must be under control uh, between March 1st or November 1st and March 15th. And then beginning on March 16th through October 31st, the dogs must be on a leash. Uh, and that, that change mainly is, is due to, to the loggerhead sea turtles, um, keeping dogs on leash during turtle season, keeping dogs from going up and potentially digging up nests and things like that. <clears throat> And then we have this area that we created, um, I don't know, it's probably been 10 or 12 years ago, in between the beach club and the ocean course clubhouse. Uh, and that is what we call the dog use area. Uh, and that is an area that, that we allow dogs to be off leash uh, year round. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm just gonna talk about the birds a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna kinda just go into we have what we call our focal species, um, and we've identified five of those. The least tern, the Wilson's plover, the American oyster catcher, the piping plover, and the red knot. And I'm just gonna talk about each one individually, a little bit about their biology, what they look like, and so forth. I'm gonna start with the least tern. Uh, the least tern is, is this, one of the smallest terns uh, that we have here. Uh, it's, it is the smallest tern that we'll have on, on Kiowa. Uh, this bird usually arrives in late March. Uh, I just got word here recently that they, they have been seen on the island already. So they are here. Uh, these guys are colonial nesters. And what that means is they'll find a spot on a beach or a rooftop. And they like to nest, put their nests together in a group. Um, safety in numbers. So, um, you know, if, and they'll lay, they, they have their own individual distances from each other. Um, so they're not piled on top of each other, but they're, far enough away that they're not gonna, they don't, can't bicker with each other too much, but they're close enough that if there is a predator or some kind of threat that the entire colony can address that threat rather than just having one, being, having one bird be on its own. Um, and for one of the reasons is, is that they do that is because they do lay their eggs right on the sand, right out into the open. Um, so they're, they're super vulnerable to disturbance and predation. <clears throat> uh, they are a, what they, we call a, their, their status is threatened uh, in South Carolina. Um, they are not, there is an endangered, I think, population out in the uh, Mississippi, Missouri River area in the inland part of the, the U.S., but our coastal one is not federally um, listed uh, and in 2020, we, in 2020, 2020 and 2021, we had approximately 150 nests out at the east end. Um, and I was told that that was one of the largest um, natural occurring um, beach nesting um, colonies that we had in the state at that time. Uh, last year, they weren't as fortunate. We had um, some beach change out there, and we had some overwash situation happen, and uh, we, I don't think we had any successful nests at all last year. So kind of what to look for when you're on the beach. So these guys are, are a little bit more distinctive. They have that kind of this yellow bill, uh, which a lot of the, most of the other terns that we have out there are going to have either an orange bill or a black bill. Uh, they have little, the le yellow legs as well, uh, and like I said, they're tiny. So like these guys are, you know, they're like the size of a robin, um, and you know, a lot of the other terns that we have are, are bigger than that. Uh, on the left, there's a little box that says S P S U F A W I. That's just spring, summer, fall, and winter, uh, and then the the other um, letters just denote kind of their their abundance here during that season. So in the spring, they are common, and in the, in the summer as well. Uh, typically, once the nesting season is over, these birds disperse, uh, and they become a little bit less common in the fall, so we don't see as many of them in the fall. And then during the fall, they migrate out of here, um, and they go, they go south, 
uh, and we don't have any lease turns uh, here in on Kiowa or in the state um, at all during the winter time. If you see a little bird that looks kind of like that on the right or on the left corner, that's a juvenile lease turn. So uh, that's what they look like, kind of um, you know a week, several weeks out of out of being hatched. Uh, so they look a little different than the adult, uh, but usually you'll see them uh, sitting on the beach, and they'll be with with other lease turns. So you'll you'll kind of be able to recognize that it's a, a juvenile lease turn. Um, another key feature on this bird is that, that kind of that black kind of cap on their head with that, that bright white forehead. That, that, that contrast usually stands out pretty well, um, and even when they're flying, you can see that. Uh, so I kind of talked about camouflage a little bit um, and how and these birds just kind of nest right on the beach. So this is a, a photo of from a couple years ago when we had those least turns nesting, you can kind of see the adult sitting there with its newly hatched chick there right to the right. Uh, their, their color is, is really close to the color of our sand. Uh, their eggs are also super camouflaged as well. All right, the next one is the Wilson's Plover. Um, this is a, a medium-sized plover. It's a, another shorebird species um, that, that nests on the island. Um, these guys start nesting between March and July. Um, they're, they're here now. They may already have nests potentially out uh, on the east end. Um, we do have Wilson's plovers present here year-round, so there's these birds do ne um, they, they nest here, but they're also here during the wintertime as well. Um, they may not be the same individuals, though, so the birds that nest here, my, they, those birds may migrate south, and then we get birds from other places that may come here for the winter. Um, I have done some, some banding of Wilson's plovers on, on Kiowa, um, and we've had a kind of a variety um, of resites for these birds. So we've had some birds that we've seen with flags only here during the breeding season. Um, and obviously those birds then migrate away from here and they only use Kiowa for breeding. We've had some birds that we've seen year round um, so some birds that don't leave, they just stay here, they're residents. And then we've had a bird that, two different individuals that I've banded, um, and they have been recited in the winter in uh, Venezuela. Uh, so showing that these birds that come here, that breed here on Kiowa, they, they spend the winter in, in the northern part of Venezuela. <clears throat> uh, again, these guys are, are not colonial nesters like the least terns. They're more solitary. Uh, so they will lay their eggs directly on the sand as well, but they usually choose some vegetation to lay their eggs among. So um, rather than just being right out in the open, um, if there's a little patch of, of grass or some sort of veg, you'll see it. They're, they're going to nestle it kind of right at the base of that or kind of right next to it or, or maybe some rack or something, some kind of little bit of structure on the beach. They're going to kind of hide their eggs a little bit. Um, what they will do is they will nest right out in the open. And you know what I did? I did not plug my computer in. Uh, they will lay their eggs right in the, in the open uh, on the sand amongst the least turn colony. And they will let the least turns kind of help. So uh, if, if there is a least turn colony, then they will, uh, they will kind of just go right up in the middle of them and they'll take the benefit of the least turns helping protect them and use that flocking strategy. All right, we'll wait for this to come back up. Sure. Um, they will, um, and a, a lot of times what will happen is it's, they'll have a second clutch if their first clutch got predated or, or you know, something happened to it. Um, there, there's a lot of parental investment um, involved with raising a shorebird chick since they, um, they, when they hatch out of the egg, they're mobile within 
hours and they're up and running around. So, uh, and they rely on their parents to, to feed them for a while. Um, so they can't just, like, that, that bird's not going to be on its own for, you know, like a songbird, which, you know, within a, a week or so of hatching, it's kind of on its own and it's doing its own thing. Uh, there's a lot more parental care with shorebirds, so there's just not enough time in the season uh, for these birds to have a clutch, raise that clutch, and then do another one. Um, now, if they can get a really super early start, possibly, uh, but I think for the most of them, if, if they have a successful clutch, they're probably just going to be happy with that and, and put their, their time into, into the, the chicks that they had. And do they have a lot of eggs at one time? They don't. So typically it is three eggs uh, is, is a kind of your normal clutch um, on, on Lee's Terns and Wilson's Plovers and a lot of the shorebirds. You know, they're not going to do any more than three normally. Um, their first clutch is usually going to have three, and if they have to re-nest due to some failure, uh, the second clutch may only have two. Um, so, the, you know, they just, they won't have that. As the season goes on, resources get much depleted, um, so they just don't have that time to, to invest in trying to raise three chicks, so they'll, they'll maybe just do the two. <clears throat> All right, I think we're back up. Um, so, like, just like the, the lease turn, the, the status uh, for Wilson's plovers are also threatened at a state level. Uh, and then, you know, every year we have several nesting pairs of, le of Wilson's plovers, uh, and that mainly occurs, pretty much only occurs out on the east end. Um, although this year, I'm hoping the, the habitat has gotten much better for them down at the west end, uh, out at the Captain Sam's Inlet. So. Um, I'm hoping that maybe there'll be some, some Wilsons that might take up um, nesting kind of at that end of the island this year. All right, so this is kind of what they look like. Um, you're kind of your standard plover shape. Um, they stand fairly upright. Um, they have, in, in, when you're talking about a, a plover, they have a really large bill compared to the other plover that you might see a lot of on the island, which is um, semi-palmated plover uh, or piping plovers. They have much smaller bills. These guys have a much larger bill. Um, and that, that's because they like to eat uh, fiddler crabs. So they use that, they use that big bill um, to grab those fiddler crabs and they can shake that claw off and then they can, um, then they can eat, the, eat the, the rest of the crab. Um, but overall, they're just kind of a brown bird um, they have this kind of this stripe that comes across their chest. Those are both males in this picture. So they have a black stripe here on females. It's going to be brown. So you can tell the difference between a male and a female Wilson's plover. Uh, you can't in least turns. They look pretty much identical. Um, and then one of the other key differences is the color of the legs. So they have this kind of this flesh colored leg color. Um, it's, you know, kind of a grayish color overall. Your other, your other um, piping plovers um, are going to have kind of an orange leg, and your semi-palmated plovers are going to have kind of more of a yellow colored leg. So um, a lot of times when you're looking at shorebirds, even if they look, a lot of them look really similar, the, the things that you're going to look at to try to help narrow down your search is the color of legs, um, that's one of the, the, the things that you can do. And sometimes that will help narrow it down to at least from 20 species down to maybe 10. Um, and then from there, you can look at other features like bill length and shape, and then you can kind of keep narrowing it down again. Um, but we're not going to get into all that shorebird identification stuff today. We're just going to focus on these, these five here that, that, we're, that we have. So... Um, can you see the Wilson's Plover chicks in this picture? So these guys are probably only a few days old. Um, and once they hatch, like I mentioned before, they are mobile like within hours of hatching. Um, and they will basically just kind of run and hide. And they just kind of hunker down um, in rack in little parts of the grass. Um, the parents, a lot of times, will take them from the beach where they nested back into the back 
behind the dunes into those, the marshy area. Uh, there's a lot more grasses that they can, the chicks can hide in there. Uh, so a lot of times what we'll see is we'll see a bunch of Wilson's plovers. Um, we know they have nests. We'll sometimes see some chicks running around and then all of a sudden they're gone. Um, and presumably these, they, they've taken their chicks to more protected areas to kind of keep them uh, from getting eaten by other things. Uh, and then later in the season, all these Wilson's plovers show up again and they bring, come back to the beach uh, part and it's these guys with their adults, but they now look more closer like the, like an adult. So they've kind of brought them back once they've kind of grown up a little bit um, and now they're, they're back kind of more out in the open. All right, the next one is the American oyster catcher. Uh, this is a large bird. This is one of the larger shorebirds that you're going to see out on the beach. Uh, very distinctive. Um, there's not any other bird out there that looks quite like an oyster catcher. Um, you may, black skimmer might be a close one because they also have kind of an orange bill and a black head, but their bill is completely shaped differently. Um, these guys have a long, narrow orange bill. Uh, they've got that dark black um, kind of head with that bright colored yellow eye, and they've got that bright orange ring around that eye as well. Um, and these guys also are solitary nesters, um, so they're going to be kind of nesting by themselves. Uh, they usually choose a higher spot on the beach. So from what we've seen over the years with, with oyster catchers is if there's like a little dune, the rest of this beach is kind of flat and there's like a little hill right here, they're going to put their nest right on top of that hill. Uh, and they are... They're, they're also very wary, so they will flush from their nest pretty quickly. Um, so you don't have to get really close to an oyster catcher and it's gonna start to walk off its nest. Um, so they, they tend to, um, their nests tend to fail a lot on Kiowa, although we do have some that, um, that are successful each year. Uh, but, but we do have several where we've, when we've monitored these nests and then they're there for a week and then all of a sudden they're gone. Um, predation, something, something potentially happened to it. Um, and the Carson, no, they, they will try again if that happens. Um, but, uh, the, the east end of the island is, is where these guys are going to be nesting. Um, last year we actually had a good number of oyster catchers. Um, uh, they, they nested in front of, by the ocean course, but then they also wrapped around the island. And I heard about several nests further down where we don't normally go um, and where a lot of people also don't go as well. So um, I think they, they're able to find some, some habitat down at that end to be successful as well. Uh, but like, like I said, like with all the other shorebirds, they lay their eggs directly on top of the sand. Uh, a lot of times it's, like I said, in a little higher elevation. Um, and uh, these guys mainly feed on bivalves, which is kind of their, the, with, like as their name, they're oyster catchers. So they have that that long bill that allows them to kind of grab some kind of a clam or anything and uh, they can kind of pry that, that, that shell a little bit and they can snip that, that muscle that keeps those, those closed and then that allows them to open that muscle up and, and eat, the, eat the meat. Uh, so oyster catchers are pretty common here year round. Um, again, we will see different birds probably in different seasons so a lot of times the birds that nest here may not be the ones that actually are here in the winter and vice versa um, but like i said big heavy red bill you got that red eye ring around a yellow eye with the black head uh, and kind of the brown upper parts with kind of white up underneath <clears throat> and during during fall migration we can see large flocks of these birds um, roosting out on the beach. So, you know, we could see flocks of, of 150 or, or more um, that, that we'll see kind of at, you know, roosting, just sitting on the, on, the, on the beach or maybe back behind the island a little bit too. So that's kind of what a juvenile um, oyster catcher looks like. That bird's probably several weeks, a couple, few weeks old. Um, and again, very, 
good parental care with shorebirds. So they're, they're really good parents. They protect them. They show them how to feed. They show them what to look for. They, they'll carry, they bring them to the water's edge. They'll point to something, let the shorebird learn how to. So they're, they're teaching their chicks a lot of things. Uh, again, unlike songbirds, which a lot of that is innate. They raise them, they hatch them. Those birds just know what to do. Uh, these, these guys um, are being taught a lot, of, a lot of things by their parents. <clears throat> All right, next is the red knot. Um, so this is a medium-sized shorebird. Uh, this guy is a migrant, so we only see this bird here during either winter or during the migration period. Uh, they nest all the way up in the high Arctic, um, as you can see on the map there in the orange area, uh, and they, they spend their winter um, throughout Florida. Uh, they can well winter across the northern part of South America, and they can also winter as far south as the, the southern tip of South America as well. Uh, they have one of the longer migrations of, of any bird species, um, you know, from wintering at the tip of South America, going all the way up to the Arctic. Um, and uh, they obviously then they do that twice, so they can travel a many, many thousands of miles every year going back and forth uh, from the Arctic to, to the, the southern tip of South America. Um, they do, they stage in these, these areas um, between March and May. Uh, the Kiowa Seabrook area is an important staging area for red knots. They come here in large numbers uh, to feed mainly on coquina clams that we have a lot of in our, in our beach. Um, there are other areas that I mentioned, the, the horseshoe crabs. So Delaware Bay is another really important staging area for red knots. Uh, they time their migration to coincide with horseshoe crab um, egg laying there. Um, but they also um, use, a lot of birds use Kiowa, um, and they don't end up even going to Delaware Bay because they can find enough food here, and they skip Delaware Bay, and then they go straight to the Arctic from here. So um, this area is, we, we've known we've had a lot of red knots here, um, but it's becoming more important and more known how important this area is to the entire population of, of the, the eastern red knots. <clears throat> uh, they are federally threatened. Um, this happened four or five years ago. Can't remember the exact t uh, what year it was, uh, but they are federally threatened species um, due to the the, uh, the precipitous decline in their population. Uh, there was a study that was done on our beach uh, a couple years ago, and uh, it concluded that we have about seventeen thousand red knots that pass through the Kiowa Seabrook area uh, during spring. So obviously we don't see all 17,000 at one time. Um, you know, we might have a flocks between three and 5,000 birds here at one time, um, but there's constant turnover in those flocks. So, um, you know, they, they studied, uh, looked at band recite combinations because a lot of these birds have, have bands on their legs. So they know, you know, that if they can tell kind of when that bird was here and for how long, and then another bird would show up, and then that one would not be seen anymore. So, you know, they kind of can get, they use fancy, what they call a superpopulation model to determine this, this kind of this estimate uh, based on a turnover rate of, of birds uh, to kind of get to this 17,000 birds. Uh, and that's actually 41% of the total population of red knots on that, that use the, the east, um, the eastern uh, United States, or in North America, the hemisphere, actually. Uh, so this is just kind of showing a little bit about, about red knot migration. So uh, as I mentioned already, they have one of the longest migrations. Uh, they can travel over 9,000 miles from their wintering area at the southern tip of South America to the uh, Arctic breeding grounds. Uh, in the spring, uh, Keogh Island is a major staging area. Um, we've seen up to 5,000 red knots uh, regularly that roost or forage kind of on our, on our shoreline here. Um, this is a critical time for red knots. Uh, they need to build up their fat reserves because they, they have to still go a long way to their nesting area. So, um, you know, they're here to eat a lot of food and they're here to um, 
to also molt their feathers. So when, when these birds do arrive here, they kind of look brown, tan color. Um, and by the time they leave here, they look, um, they kind of have a red, nice red color to them, which I'll show you in the next slide. <clears throat> so, you know, because these birds have to put on so much weight while they're here, um, one of the reasons we're doing this and why we're here today is to try to help keep those birds from, from expending energy that they don't have to, and that's disturbance. So, you know, as, as dogs and people walk on the beach and these birds are constantly foraging, they have to then, they're flying. So when they fly, they're wasting energy that they need to store um, to, to kind of finish that migration. <clears throat> so this is kind of what a red knot would look like. The, the, the big picture in the middle is kind of what a red knot looks like um, either during the winter before, before they get their breeding season plumage. Um, juveniles also look like this as well. So overall, they're just kind of a gray color. Uh, they have kind of a, a white belly, and they've got these kind of barred flanks on their side, which aren't super distinct, like lines, like you might see on a clapper rail. Everybody, anybody seen a clapper rail and what the what the bar, nice fine barring looks like on a clapper rail? It's a little bit messier on on, on red knots. Um, they may have either kind of a yellow colored leg or a black leg, depending on the season. Um, they have a medium kind of length bill. Uh, and then as I mentioned, when they, when, they start to, when they start arriving here in big numbers in March, they look kind of like, like that. And they start to molt while they're here. So they're, they're, changing, they're changing their clothes basically from that plumage into what we see down here in the right-hand corner uh, into a kind of a change from that grayish color to a red um, head and red breast. Their back gets kind of black with kind of more red flecks and grays. Uh, so they're, they're kind of, those adults are, are moving from their winter plumage into their breeding plumage. All right, and the last one we're going to talk about is the piping plover. Uh, this is a, a medium-sized plover, so it's a little bit smaller than the Wilson's plover that I talked about earlier. Um, there are three different populations of piping plovers. We have a group that breeds in the Great Plains area. We have some that breed in the Great Lakes area around Lake Michigan and Superior. Um, and then there's also an Atlantic population that, that breeds along the Atlantic coast. Um, so depending on, your, on which population, they have different levels of, of um, of status, but they're all federally either endangered or threatened. Um, typically, uh, we have about three to five individuals that winter on the, the east end of the island, and then about five to eight that we see on, on the west end. So we don't have large numbers of these birds using the area, but that's mainly because there's just not large, there's not a lot of piping plovers in the population. So overall population of piping plovers is much smaller. Um, so the, we do see a peak um, that probably happened maybe a couple weeks ago um, as piping plovers are moving through, um, they're going to their nesting areas where we can see a lot of piping plovers on our beaches. Um, and that usually occurs mid-March to kind of late late March, um, and I've done one survey where I've had over 100 piping plovers um, just on Kiowa, um, dri just driving the beach from one end of the island to the other. Um, there's, I mean, I've counted over 100 piping plovers, um, which, which is a pretty good number of, of those birds. Um, and they do a little different behavior during migration. Most of those migrants are not seen at the ends of the island where the wintering birds spend their time. They're mostly seen on the front beach where all the people are. Um, and they don't typically hang out on the ends because they're only here for a very short period of time. They're, they're constantly kind of moving during, during their migration. <clears throat> all right, so this is kind of what a piping plover looks like. He's much lighter in color, almost white overall. And if the light's hitting them a certain way, they do look almost bright white when they're out there. Uh, they kind of have a yellow-orange colored leg the 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 so this the bird the main bird in the main picture is kind of a 
what it kind of looks like in the winter plumage, although that bird is transitioning into breeding plumage. So you can kind of see that where I have a pale breast band, it looks kind of black right there. And then there's also a little black line on the forehead. Uh, in the wintertime, usually that, those areas are not as distinct. Uh, so this bird is, is kind of transitioning into its summer plumage. But uh, overall, they have a kind of a short little black bill in the wintertime. Um, whitish overall, and then before, a lot of times um, before they leave here um, and, and go to their breeding areas, they will molt into their, their breeding plumage, which is kind of what the picture is here on the, on the lower right. So that black band forms really well. They get that black little kind of line above between their eyes, and their bill will change from completely black to orange, um, and then their legs also brighten up a little bit, kind of from a yellow-orange to a much brighter kind of orange as well. And then, uh, uh, and then we'll see these birds actually again. Um, it seems like they'll leave here usually by the last birds move out of here in June. Um, and then we'll actually start seeing piping plovers back on the island um, again in, at, in July. <clears throat> And I'll kind of talk about that a little bit here now. Um, so I created this kind of graph just to kind of give you a visualization of, of when these species are actually here. Um, so the, the thicker the line, um, that represents kind of the more individuals that are here. So um, these are kind of all relative to each other as well. Um, even though there's not a number really associated with it, it's just kind of give you a graphic. So the thinner the line, that means there's l those less birds present and then uh, more birds come. Um, so as you can see, we'll start at the least turn. So um, obviously from January to February, there's no least turns here. Uh, they start to arrive in mid-March. We don't see a lot of them. And then all of a sudden, bam, April shows up and there are tons of them. Uh, they're here in big numbers all the way through July, which is usually when they, they kind of end um, nesting. And then from July to August, we'll have birds kind of loafing out on the beach. There are you know, a lot of juvenile birds um, from either here or other places. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see a lot of juvenile birds on Kiowa um, in July and August, even though we didn't have, maybe we didn't have that many birds that nested that nested here, and those are birds that are that are just kind of have already fledged, and they're they're just kind of congregating on our beaches. And then usually by September, these birds trickle out of here, um, and we don't see many least turns um, after the end of September. Um, Wilson's plovers, kind of the same thing. You know, we've got a, a, a population here during the winter time. We get an kind of a. a a little bit of explosion of, of numbers here in the breeding season. A lot of birds leave, but we still have some birds that are here. Um, you'll see kind of the oyster catch of the same deal. Um, you know, that fall migration period I talked about, we see a lot of them during there. During the breeding season, uh, we have a handful of birds here on the island. And then the piping plovers as well. Um, big numbers in March as birds are moving through, uh, we'll see Still see birds here through May, um, not many, in, if any, in June. And then starting in July, we actually get those birds returning from their breeding grounds. So, um, they, you know, they, if they have a successful nest in the breeding season, they'll, they'll must start migrating in July. Um, if they don't, aren't successful, they may not re-nest again. And they're just like, okay, I'm just going to not try again. I'm just going to head south. So um, we'll, start, we'll see a lot of those birds that, that won't even attempt to nest twice in the breeding season, and they'll start to just show back up, um, back either up migration or, or they'll head back to their wintering areas. And then again, red knots. Um, you can see we, we have a population here throughout the winter, uh, large numbers during spring, and then hardly any um, birds that we see here during the, the summer months. <clears throat> We do, but we don't see, we don't see the, they don't stage like they do in the spring. So 
as those birds are, are coming back south, they, they spread out more. Um, you know, they might be using different routes than they might use in the spring. So, we, you know, it's, there's not, they're not in as a big of a rush to, to get down to where they're going as they are going back in there. So, um, you know, they, they don't, they can take their time a little bit more. Um, they can stage in different areas. They can find food in different places. So they don't need to congregate in that, in those, those areas to really fatten up like they do coming back. So, um, they still are feeding up, feeding and putting on fat, but they're just, they're doing, I think they're doing fall migration in, in, in smaller chunks than they are, you know, or spreading that out over a longer period of time than they do in the summer or in the, in the spring. All right, so I'm going to wrap up here, here now. Um, just show, throw some pictures up some other birds that we have out on the island. So these are some of the more common ones that you're going to see. Uh, royal terns. Uh, I mentioned semi-palmated plovers several times. Uh, you can kind of see how they compare to the piping plover and the Wilson's plover. Uh, the sanderling, which is a, another very common bird. That's the bird that you see a lot on the front beach. The ones that are always out by the water. Um, you know, the ones that kind of run in and out with the waves. Uh, Dunlin is probably one of our most common shorebirds that we have out there. Um, they're, you're usually going to see those at the ends of the island, although you'll sometimes see Dunlin feeding along the front beach as well. Uh, Black-bellied plover is another one. This is a large plover. This is much bigger than the, uh, the Wilson's plover, um, but he's still kind of that plover shape. You know how the plovers have that kind of that shorter bill compared to your other sandpipers. Uh, Willet's another very common one that we have, um, and this bird actually does nest on Kiowa as well. Um, we didn't include it because they prefer to put their nests further back behind the dunes and they like to nest more even in the salt marsh area. Um, although there, we may find some, some willet nests in the dunes, uh, they like really, really, like where it's really grassy, um, they're going to just bury themselves in that grass and they're going to nest in there. Um, but a lot of times their nests are, are way back in the high marsh, kind of back on the back side of the island. Um, if you're familiar with like where the ocean course kind of is and you got the ocean course here and ocean park kind of sticking out like this, this back area here is a nice high marsh area and there's a lot of willets that nest in that area um, because it doesn't get flooded regularly and it only floods on really big tides. So they can lay their nests in these little high spots out there and not worry about um, getting flooded out. <clears throat> And no people go back there either, um, so they're, they're fairly protected back there. Uh, and then again, black skimmers, uh, mentioned that one. Um, they sometimes will lay in the nesting area, um, and they will actually look like they could potentially be nesting. Um, and sometimes we'll see, you know, 50 to 80 of these skimmers all laying in the nesting area. And we always hope that they nest, um, that they, they never have. Um, so I don't know if they're just using that area to loaf in or maybe they are thinking about nesting and then something happens and they decide not to uh, and move someplace else. Uh, and then I listed all the other shorebirds that we have on the island as well and wading birds that you may en end up encountering when you're out there. Um, it's a pretty good list. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but just kind of wanted to show you about, you know, there, there's a lot of other birds out there as well. Um, and by us, by us protecting the five focal species, we're also protecting all these other species as well um, by association, because a lot of these other species, um, you know, are, are using the same habitats and using the same, eating the same, some of the similar things and, and all that as well. So, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Betty from here. And, uh, yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can. Quick, quick sure. Question, um, Hold on. For me, how long do? What What's the life expectancy say of an oyster catcher? Yeah, um, I would have to look that up to to be sure, but but shorebirds in general are are longer lived species. Um, 
So, you know, like unlike your songbirds, which probably live three to five years, uh, these guys l will live a lot longer. So, you know, a, a typical shorebird probably can go 10 to 12, 15 years. Um, and there's been others, like some of these red knots that have been marked, you know, have, are, are much older than that. Um, and there's some oyster catchers that have been actually been banded that have been around Kiowa that have been, we've been seeing them for, for a long time as well. So um, they, they are typically a long lived species. Um, and, you know, they, because they, they lay fewer eggs, you know, usually in general, if you lay fewer eggs, you're a longer lived species. Um, if you lay a lot of eggs, you usually are a species that don't live as long. Um, just kind of the way that that works, right? Because you're spreading out your, your parental energy um, across a long life, but you're going to put more investment into those fewer eggs as opposed to trying to do as much as you can in a shorter period of time. Any other questions? We can do more at the end, too. Hi again. So that was, that was a lot of information. But basically, it was just to let you understand how many birds depend on and use our island for their survival. And how lucky are we that we have opportunity to even get to see some of these awesome birds that few people get to see. Um, so, uh, yes, shorebirds are in trouble, and they truly need our help. So uh, some good news, though, is that Audubon released a study a few years ago showing that beaches that have shorebird stewardship programs have made a positive effect on shorebird populations. Several coastal bird species have grown their populations considerably faster than birds in areas without active stewardship programs. So stewards do make a difference. Aaron spoke about the reasons that shorebirds need our help, but I'm just going to cover sort of quickly the details of our stewardship program. The focus of what we do is to uh, get out on the beach and to educate and inspire beachgoers to appreciate and care about our shorebirds. We're not out there to be police or enforcers, but we're really just there to simply share with folks about the birds in a positive way and let people know how to help them and how to share the beach with them. Our season is from now through July, and we ask for just a minimum a commitment of six hours from each steward. Of course, we're hoping that you enjoy it enough that you want to steward longer than that, but uh, six hours is our minimum. And then after you have stewarded those six hours, you get rewarded with a really nice, uh, beautiful shorebird stewardship t-shirt. And this year's t-shirt, we change the bird every year. Um, this year's t-shirt is an oyster catcher with two chicks on it. So a little teaser. Uh, this is just a quick view of what birds we mainly focus on with stewardship. The red knots visit, as you know, from mainly March through most of May to rest and eat. Piping plovers winter here from October all the way through March. And then the top three, they're the main ones who nest out on the east end from spring through July. We also have other birds nest out there too, like the um, black neck stilt uh, that you saw in one of Aaron's slides. You get to see those out there too. They're really crazy, so crazy looking. So we are in the early part of our season. The knots keep arriving now. We currently have over 2,000 of them. I don't have a current, I haven't heard what the current count is, but I know it's over 2,000. <laughs> so um, they don't have their rusty, famous rusty red colors yet. They're just sort of that drab grayish color that Aaron showed. They'll continue to arrive, and we expect to have many more of them soon. Um, and then they're going to, they're soon to be, if not already starting to molt into their beautiful red breeding plumage that we all know and love. And then when they're plump 
and rested and ready, they typically leave here in mid-May to fly to the Arctic. Um, during this period of time when they're here on our island, we need, need stewards doing two different things. When the tide is high, the knots roost out on the west end of the island like at Captain Sam's. And so we need stewards to be out there at Captain Sam's spit protecting the roosting flock by talking to folks about how important it is for them to be able to rest and conserve their energy, you know, in order to complete their migration and successfully breed. Um, then as the tide starts to drop, then their food source gets exposed and that's when they wanna eat. So the, they break out of their main flock and they start foraging for food often all along our island beach. And you're, you will see them in flocks strung out along the water's edge, feeding and poking the sand like little sewing machines. And they're in a little close together, well not little, sometimes these flocks are enormous, but they stick together. They, you'll notice that they're different than other shorebirds. They really stick together, not only when they're hanging out on the beach, but also when they fly, they stay in a, a tight flock. Um, so when they are out there in the middle of their critically important task of feeding, they often get disturbed uh, by walkers, runners, dogs, children chasing them, bicyclists riding through them on purpose, or people who just want a beautiful Instagram picture of a gorgeous flock rising in flight, they will disturb them on purpose to get a good shot of that. Um, and so they really, really have trouble having the peace and quiet and respect to just be able to feed when they need to eat. And it's so critical to their survival. So we need stewards out there on the beach with those foraging uh, knots, just talking to people on the beach and telling them again how important it is to not disturb them and let them eat or let them rest. Give them space on the beach, share the beach with them. So the time to do this is when the tide has just begun to drop about two hours after high tide and all the way up till about two hours before the next high tide. So there's like an eight hour window t around that time when the knots tend to be foraging and you would see them along our front beach. Um, so we're hoping that since many folks enjoy a regular beach walk anyway, that you might consider timing it during this window of time when you might happen upon a flock of foraging knots. And it's an easy way to combine shorebird stewarding with a typical leisure activity. You just go for a walk. And then after the knots depart, we turn our focus toward the nesting area out on the east end, just past the ocean course. Nesting starts this month and chicks should be happening soon, which is very fun to see those out there. Um, so we need our stewards to be out there either sitting by the nesting area or walking along and talking to beachgoers about how to give the birds plenty of space to safely nest and raise their young out there. So um, besides a hat and sunglasses, you want to wear a name tag, which we provide. This is mine, and it'll look like this. Um, and so I find that just having a name tag hanging on your neck <laughs> makes people on the beach think that you're somebody who's official in some way, and they notice it. <clears throat> so definitely, you want to wear the name tag that we give you. And when you have earned your t-shirt, you wear that and um, when you're out there stewarding too, and people will notice that too. We also provide you with a set of laminated materials. These are mine that I use. They're, on, they're just uh, the birds that Erin just talked to you about. Pretty uh, pictures of them and talking points on the back that you could uh, study yourself if you want to. But anyway, we, we do give uh, issue these and um, they're just nice pictures that you can show of the various shorebirds. They just help beachgoers be able to see what you're talking to them about. The problem with shorebirds is 
you know, they can't get an up-close look at how awesome they are. Red knots are gorgeous, but, you know, you can't get up close to them without disturbing them. So it's helpful to be able to show folks pictures of them. They love it. They love to see the pictures. So carry these with you when you're out there talking with people. And binoculars. If you have binoculars, wear those or take those with you. Um, it's so helpful. I often share my binoculars with people on the beach to let them be able to see the birds closer up, and they tend to like that and always have sort of, they're more chatty when they're sharing your binoculars, so they learn more about the birds that way. Um, and then plus, you're going to want to be able to see the red knots and the stuff too, so make sure you, if you don't have binoculars, get some. And then, of course, you want to have a cell phone on you because it's just a good idea in case you need to um, call Beach Patrol or to report something that might be going on out there. Okay, so you're likely thinking, well, I don't know much about shorebirds, so how will I even know how to talk to people about them? Or how will I even know what to say? Um, and I felt that way too when I sat in on a very first shorebird stewardship meeting. I can assure you, if you decide you want to be a shorebird steward, you won't be left alone to figure that out. Um, if you should decide to join the sh stewardship program, you get a copy of this presentation emailed to you so that you can review it. Um, the meeting here is being recorded, so you can always watch it again for review. I email throughout the season, actually throughout the year, I email educational information and news of shorebird-related events. I email my stewards regularly um, so that they can continue to learn through that also. Um, we also try to host uh, a number of bird walks where we can go out on the island as a group and look at shorebirds together and learn about them. And then I also try to line up speakers to provide webinars for the, our stewards, and then I tend to open it island-wide too. But um, anyway, they're always uh, real helpful to learn from speakers. And then there, these websites here are really good, full of you know, great information, so those websites too. But don't, the big thing about stewarding, especially if you don't know much about uh, shorebirds, is don't be overwhelmed by it all. It's a good idea in the beginning to mainly focus on learning just those few birds that Aaron talked about, the, the focal ones. And um, you'll find that when you're out in the beach, when you're listening to talks, when you're reading an article that I send or whatever, you just start slowly growing in your knowledge. It's just sort of, it's a natural progression. And so um, you do not, I want to emphasize this, you do not have to be an expert on shorebirds or shorebird identification. Everyone always worries about that. And you do not. I'm not. I'm still learning every day, and, and that's the fun of it. That's the wonder of the bir world of birds is you're just always learning, and um, all you really need to be a steward is a heart for the birds and a desire to help them, and it just grows. Your knowledge just kind of grows from that. Okay, so... Uh, when you're on the beach. As mentioned previously, we're, we are there to educate. And it's been my experience that beachgoers don't want to hear a whole lot. They don't need to hear a whole lot of information, just a little bit about the challenges the birds face and what people can do to help them, or just simply share some amazing fact or information about their lives. Um, since the average person on the beach can't get close enough to truly see the birds without causing them to fly, again, use the laminated pictures to show them the up-close images. Um, be enthusiastic about the birds. Enthusiasm is often contagious, and if you can share anything to help somebody sort of connect to the birds, to make them feel compassion or respect something the bird's able to do um, for them, you know, just a, a respect for them, the struggles they face, then that's, you've done your job as a steward. And I always end most conversations with, when I'm stewarding with folks, is to um, ask the beachgoers to help spread the word themselves, tell other people. And most of them love to tell people about the red knots. They go on to spread that really, really nicely. 
Okay, just a few don'ts. As I said before, I can't emphasize it enough. You don't have to be a shorebird expert. You don't have to be able to identify all kinds of different birds, but you'll learn as you go along. Also, again, we keep all interactions on our part friendly and positive. Even if you come upon somebody doing something that angers or frustrates you, you still approach them in a very open, friendly way because they probably don't realize what they've done. Um, so we're there to educate and share the uh, story of the, of the birds. Um, it's been my experience that most people that I talk to just simply don't know about the challenges facing shorebirds and the help they need. They, they just don't know. And so usually when they know better, then they do better. So that's where stewards come in. Um, and lastly, it's rare, but if someone were to get very angry with you, simply back off immediately and just call island security, you know, if needed. Um, I've, this is my sixth year of stewarding, and I've never had to do that. So it doesn't really happen often, but it's good to know. You don't continue to engage. You just, you know, you're not going to reach that person or get them to understand anyway. So you just sort of back off and if, if you feel like it's something that security should know, then you just report them. Um, let's see. I keep my, I keep Beach Patrol's number in my phone just to make it really easy to, to uh, do that if needed. So in review, keep all these points in mind. But most importantly, the Shorebird Stewards experience is supposed to be fun. It's fun. And it's a fun, it's an opportunity to share how awesome our shorebirds are with fellow beachgoers. And so that's it, more or less. For those of you who decide you are interested in shorebird stewardship, there is a sign-up sheet right up here. Um, please provide your information and print legibly so I know if uh, I got the right spelling for your name tags or your email addresses and things like that. Um, I realize there's probably lots of questions regarding some of the logistics of all this. Um, there will be more de details emailed to folks who become a steward. But if you want to discuss anything or have any questions, I'm happy to talk with anybody on the phone. Um, or you can email me, whatever's comfortable for you. So um, I just want everybody else to feel good about it. And that is more or less it. Um, I guess I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your interest in the Shorebirds and the program. Uh, of course, we would love new members in the program, but if you decided that just doesn't work in your life, um, I'm just happy at least that you're here and that you got to learn about the birds and the challenges and um, how you can help them yourself. Um, and hopefully some of you will spread the word to others. So I always like to end by saying, you know, the birds need everybody to know and so tell your family and friends about shorebirds and the troubles they're in and how we all need to help them. Teach your kids and your grandkids that, about them too. So they just need everybody to know. Um, and that's really it. So does anybody have questions for Aaron or, or me? I do have a question. Yeah? For new people who are interested, do you send them out with a more experienced steward or do you just give people the bird packet and send them out? What, whatever they want to do. I like to, I kind of manage my program sort of to fit however people's preferences are. So if people are feeling, some people feel really confident and they feel like they can go out and talk on the beach to people. So they kind of go off on their own. But, uh, but a lot of new people will ask if they can be, uh, go out with somebody. Oftentimes it's me. I, I'll go out with uh, folks. Um, I'll even, sometimes I go out um, just you know, individually with people, or I've tried um, just sort of letting people know, hey, I'm going to go out looking for red knots. Anybody want to join me tomorrow? And then I might get, I think one year we had, what, four or five, and um, stewards join in on that. So usually once you see it done once, that's what people always tell me. All I needed to see is you do it one time, and then I get it, you know? And it's really easy. I mean, I, I did this for another uh, presentation, but you know, I can tell you how I do it. I, I've been doing it for six years, and I almost have the same spiel 
for everybody. I use the same kind of opening line with everybody. I'll just go up to somebody on the beach and I'll say, hey, do you know about these birds right here? See, and so I'm acting like I'm about to tell them something really cool, right? So they, that piques their interest. And then they'll go, no, what is that? And then I'll say, That's, those are red knots, and they have one of the longest migrations of any animal on the planet. They fly, many of them, from the lowest tip of South America all the way up to the Arctic to breed. Well, that always gets their attention. They're like, you're kidding. And, th and then I'll say, yeah, and they're really in trouble. Their numbers are declining. And you know, I'll, I'll mention you know, a line or two of how much they're declining. And then they'll go, you know, then you'll, they'll say, well, why is that? And then it's perfect. Then you say, well, um, a lot of it, there's a number of reasons, but a lot of it is human disturbance. And so that's why we're out here trying to tell folks how important it is to let them eat when they need to eat and rest when they need to rest because they're trying to fatten up and get strong and be fit enough to survive the rest of their journey to the Arctic and breed successfully there. So, I mean, unless they start asking me more questions, which a lot of people will, you'll get people who are really enthusiastic and want to know more. Um, most of the time, that's all I say. And, and sometimes it's shorter than that because you kind of will be able to tell who kind of is interested or who wishes you weren't talking to them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you can kind of get that glazed eye look and then you know you just say, hey, we're just out here trying to encourage people to walk around the flocks because this is a federally threatened bird so we're asking folks to give them lots of space. Then you just kind of, you'll kind of get the feel of that. Oops. Oh no, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good pitch. Thank you. The whole pitch was great. Uh, so just a couple part questions. One, so the schedule is around the tides. It sounds like what you said, right? You, yeah our window based on the tide so it can move during the day. When the red knots are here. When the red knots are when here. When the red knots are here, it's our stewarding is very tide dependent. Um, on the tides. Affected, yeah. Okay. okay, and then how many... Oh, go ahead. With your and how many people do you have, like, on a shift? Well, that's the... How does that work? I, you know, I just, honest, it's full disclosure. Hopefully enough, right? <laughs> I used to schedule... I used to have a schedule with shifts. And um, for the first couple of years that I stewarded. And I just kind of learned that people, at least my stewards, don't really like to be locked into shifts. And so they wouldn't sign up on the sign up sheet, but yet they were calling me and letting me know that they had just finished X number of hours here or X number. So they were stewarding, but they just, it, it was very hard to get people to want to sign up for shifts. So I realized that I am just thrilled to have warm bodies on the beach talking to folks about the shorebirds. So I want the program to be easy, and so it's got to be what works in your life. Nobody's locked into anything. Um, and so I, we were only talking about those periods of time for the red knots because that's when they need stewarding, you know, like, and how to steward those. The, um, the red knots, when they're roosting at high tide, the water goes up and covers their food source, right? So they can't eat, so they're going to rest. That's their time to rest. So they're all roosted in a big, usually a big, big flock out on, on, at Captain Sam's, sometimes on the Seabrook side, sometimes on our side. Um, but then when they need to eat, their food, you know, the tide starts dropping, and then their food source is exposed, and so they start peeling out of that roosting flock, and then they start stringing out along Kiowa and feeding. And so that's why... If you're interested in stewarding the foraging flocks, the feeding flocks, I was just using that little eight-hour window of time as the optimum time to do that. Is that you really need people. I think it's good to tell people I really need people. Uh, maybe I'm used to Turtle Patrol where it's like we are. <laughs> yes. This is the window, and this is what you do, and it's just highly structured. Yes. And the challenge for Kiowa is that we have a 10-mile beach. And the knots utilize a lot of it. And so it's really hard to get stewards everywhere. So what we do is I have, I don't have a fancy name for it, but it's sort of a text alert, like a group text alert. So when somebody is walking, and I encourage stewards too to 
text the group and say, hey, large flock of knots at boardwalk 12 need stewards here ASAP or something. And that way, some people will say, I can be there, you know, and they'll throw on their shirts and go. Um, but it also gives you, as a steward, good information to where the knots are and when, you know, because um, the next day they would likely, not always, but likely be in that same vicinity around that same time again. So it just helps people to kind of know where to go when they're stewarding. Sure. I had a situation and I was with an experienced steward and um, there were uh, people and they were disturbing the birds and we had a very nice conversation and then they continued to do it, continued to do it, continued to do it. Because of the way, because of the situation with the birds, is there some sort of fine um, that can be... Um, you mean when you talk to them, they, did they seem to receive it well but then just disregarded the info? Is that what you're saying? They disregarded the info from the first conversation, and I, my experienced steward was friendly and full of knowledge, and they didn't care. And so they continued to do it, and then did it again, and then did it again as they chased the flock down the beach. I mean, it's like a federally protected species. Yes. There's a real problem if you touch it, right? Is there a yeah, Aaron, Aaron, what would you suggest? That would be a good one for Aaron. That's a good question. So, we, we do have an ordinance oh. by Kiowa that is very rarely enforced, but it is there that you cannot harass an endangered species. So, we could potentially ticket that person for doing that. Um, Ideally, in that situation, what you would probably would, first thing you would do would be to either call Beach Patrol or myself, and if I'm available or they are there, they could talk to them. When somebody rolls up in a truck that looks more official, they're more likely to stop. Um, and, you know, like then, of course, Beach Patrol or myself have the authority to issue either a written warning, which a lot of times that will do the trick, because then we have their information, and if we if they do it again, um, or a an actual fine, um, which could be up to you know two hundred dollars with after you do all the assessments. The ticket itself is like fifteen or twenty bucks, but then the state and everything puts assessments on it, and it ends up being like two hundred bucks. So and so is is that I had a situation where there was three dogs in the critical habitat area. And I said, I'm not dealing with this. I called Beach Patrol. They came out there. And um, so I, I said, did you uh, write them a ticket? No, I usually just let them. How many, how many warnings do you give them? Yeah, that's something that I need to. Do those tickets stick? Or do they fight those tickets? Zero. Well, usually, if it's, a, if it's a real ticket, then yes, they, it sticks. Unless they come to court and then whatever reason, it, you know, I think it's changed. Um, but that, that doesn't normally happen. So uh, most of the time, if they do get a, an actual ticket, they just pay the fine because they don't want to come to court. Um, but um, if they do come to court and try to challenge it, then the, the person writing the ticket will actually have to come to court to, you know, and do and, and, and defend that, writing that ticket. So. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think a lot of tickets are being issued. I think it's mostly warnings right now. Um, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna kind of find out what our official stance is on that um, because it, I, it. So when Beach Patrol does do warnings, they're supposed to be logging that name into a database, and then if they see that name again come up for the second time. Uh, as I understand it, is then that's when they write a ticket if it's a repeat offender. I just don't know how well that's being followed. So I need to follow up with that and kind of see. 
I, I just want to add to that that um, I, I hate that that happened, and I know it happens out there, but honestly, I would say 99% of your interactions with beachgoers are usually very positive. And so, yes, you get a few of those. Um, you'll kind of, again, experience kind of... Realize which ones you, you know, like if you, what I, in that situation, if it was me, I think it, I would have to see how I felt at the time, but I probably would say was, you know, either sir or ma'am or whoever it was, uh, these are federally protected birds. And so I'm going to have to, if you don't stop that, I'm going to have to take your picture and report you. And so sometimes just saying you, you might, might have to take their picture and report them you know, that'll do it. And so you don't like to do that because then you're sort of being negative. But if they, I mean, this would be in a case where they are just disregarding what you say and they're going to do what they want and are really a problem in the birds. Then, you know, I would probably suggest to them that they're federally protected birds and they're going to get their picture taken and reported. <laughs> Somebody over here has a question. But I'm wondering, is there some way that when visitors come, um, is there information given to them or is it on the rental agreement that this, this is serious and, it, you know, enough is enough. We're, we're losing habitat and birds and, and everything else. Can't they just... As of right now, I don't believe there's anything in the rental stuff or, or out there right now. Um, Kiowa, the town of Kiowa, the Conservancy, and Kika push out a lot of information on their, you know, um, social media and, and websites and, and e-blasts and things, trying to educate folks. But in terms of literature, I don't really think that there's much out there. Um, that has been discussed as a project that we might want to consider with the rental properties. I, I hesitate in that in a way, I mean, probably eventually we'll do that, but when I was a young mom and arriving on Tequila Island to commence with my vacation with the kids, I probably didn't read all the stuff that was in my folder of stuff that the rental people gave me. So I don't know how effective that would be, but it, it is something that we're considering. Was there another? That was my question. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah, the other, some people have said hand out things at the gate. I mean, everybody's got different ideas. We're really pushing signage this year. The DNR has provided awesome signage. We're, we're trying to get stuff out. I think the signs are really helping, we've heard. Yeah. I don't down at the ocean course. Is that where we Yes. Um, and I kind of feel bad because the nesters are already kind of getting busy out there and we're busy with the red knot still. So I always feel bad. They're kind of like, so we have, I have like a couple stewards that are diehard East Enders and they'll always be out there with the, with the uh, nesting birds. One of them sitting right there. But, um, but anyway, yes, as, as soon as the red knots are gone, which is usually second to third week of May, then we turn all attentions. Oh, the front beach, we don't worry about. It's all attentions go to that nesting area. And it's actually a really fun thing to steward out there when the chicks start happening. It's kind of exciting. Well, it is exciting to see the birds on their nests, but even way better when you got binoculars to um, see the chicks. If we do see, and I see this out there, and you get there. And a lot, you know, especially balloons, you see back in the nesting areas, just, you just don't touch anything, you don't touch trash. Or well, nobody's allowed to go in there, but like Aaron, right? <laughs> I don't know if anybody can really go in there. I don't know. There are balloons weirdly out there. I always wonder why. I know. So many balloons right. out there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would answer, I guess I would say, if you see some trash in there, um, you know, if it's... I wouldn't say go walking in there and get it, but um, you know I'm I'm out there periodically looking at stuff, and when I see stuff, I will go in there and, and retrieve it. So um, you can also, if you see it, you can text, you can send an email to me or Betty, and they can let us know, and then that way I can be on the lookout for it when I'm out there next, and I can go in and get that stuff. Yeah. If you want to uh, sort of scout the east end. Of of the island. Yeah. 
where can you, how can you get there other than walking? Can you, can you park a car down there? You mean where the nesting area is? Yeah. Um, so you would park at the ocean course. So if you are pulling into the ocean course, there's two parking lots. I'd park on the left and you can, you can walk down along that, what is it, a practice green there? walk along that down to the uh, beach access right there, and then you just head to the left, and you can't miss the nesting area. Um, Aaron posted it with lots of signs, and, and that whole area is a plethora of birds, so it's really a fun just to go out there. Um, besides stewarding, it's really, I, it's one of my favorite places on the island. Anybody else? Betty, I might point out too to the stewards that if you see people walking through the nesting areas that Aaron has cordoned off, you should report that to the beach patrol because there's always fishermen that try to cut through there and um, they've really disturbed the nesting areas. So be aware of that too. Either, either beach patrol or call me directly. Um, if I'm close, I can get out there and deal with it. Uh, I would rather deal with those people than be patrol because um, I can be a little bit more direct with them. Um, and uh, I might, if it, depending on where I am, I could maybe even get there quicker than be patrol if they're dealing with other things on the beach. You know, they're sometimes they can't, they just can't drop everything. And, and get to another place if they're dealing with a jellyfish sting or, you know, something. So, um, so yeah, either either you'll have, at some point on those packets, you'll have my number um, and you'll have, have the uh, Beach Patrol number. Uh, so both of those, those contacts would be, be good, good to use. One other quick thing to add, and then I'm going to let everybody go, is uh, another thing the stewards do, which I kind of think is important, is well, it is important, um, is out on the east end when you're uh, stewarding the nesting area, there's, as Aaron said, there's 120 signs, um, not all that you'd have to worry about. But the ones along the beach, because of the wind, they'll get twisted and be not facing out so that people can read them. So we have our stewards, when you're out there stewarding anyway, if you would just check the signs and if they need to be twisted back around, twist them back around for, and then, uh, and also report any that are down or missing too. So that's a, another responsibility when you're out there. So, but don't hesitate calling, texting or emailing me. I'm fine with all three. So um, thanks, everybody.